All right, we might just get started. So, um, Shen Li, can you please flip to the next slide? Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, thanks for being here. Um, we're happy to be here for another exciting coffee science uh, seminar series. So, um, uh, I'm happy to be the facilitator for this uh, seminar today. And um, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. My name is uh, Sharam Niknafs. I am a research fellow here at the Coffee at the Center for Animal Sciences. And uh, I've been here for quite a long time. And uh, we've been working with Shanley for, for a couple of uh, years now. And um, he's a really bright uh, young scientist that uh, come up with all the new ideas. So um, uh, first of all, I would like to start with the um, acknowledgement of the country. Uh, the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owner and the custod custodianship of the land on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestor and their descendant who continue cultural and spiritual uh, connections to the country. We recognize their valuable contribution to Australian and global society. So, um, before we start, uh, I would like to remind you about a, a few uh, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, just uh, please keep in mind that the seminar will be from 12 to 1. So if there is any question remaining after that, uh, we're happy to uh, have those questions sent to Shenley and he will get back to you. And then um, another point that I want to mention is related to the Q&A button. Please, if you have any question, only use the Q&A button and not the chat button. Apparently the chat button is a bit dangerous, so please don't use it. And um, uh, yep, so we get to the um, seminar with a, a bit of a introduction of our speaker. So today's speaker is Dr. Uh, uh, Shane Lei Tan. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Animal Science. And um, uh, he uh, has obtained his PhD in molecular biology from SCMB here in UQ. And he has done a postdoc related to uh, synthetic biology with Professor Robert Spite. I hope that I'm spelling this, that I'm um, reading this name correctly. So uh, currently he's doing a second postdoc with Professor Eugenie Rora here in Coffee, And his personal interest and research interest is mainly related to re reveal life metabolism from a system biology point of view. So he's uh, currently doing uh, lots of research related to animal taste and nutritional metabolism, mainly in chicken and pigs. So um, Shenley does also a lot of work related to omics, uh, and, and he brings a lot of expertise and new ideas uh, to, to the group here in Coffee, looking at different aspects of uh, uh, omics studies and how we can actually implement these technologies in, into our research. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, I guess uh, we will get to it. So uh, floor of the Zoom is yours, Shenley. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I too acknowledge the um, traditional owners and um, their custodianship of the land on which we meet today and pay my re um, respect to their ancestors and um, their descendants. So today, my topic is um, glycogenin is dis dispensable in much liver glycogen synthesis. So for those of you who are not familiar with how to pronounce a Chinese name starting with an X, um, this is um, more pronounced as um, SH. So I've put a different spelling to assist your pronunciation. Is um, You can call it Xin Le. Xin Le Tan is my name. So I'm currently doing my postdoc in um, Professor Eugenie Rowers' group. A brief introduction about um, where, um, who I am academically. So personally, I love um, molecular biology. And I did my PhD with professional, uh, Professor Benjamin Schultz um, in SMB from 2017 to 2021. Uh, we are doing a lot of proteomics relating to um, yeast metabolism about glycogen. And we're also doing some metabolomics 
and um, glycosylation study. So my first postdoc is at QUT with um, Professor Robert Spate, who is now the director for Cyro Future Protein Platform. So we are doing um, synthetic biology using PKIA as the model organism to produce alternative protein productions um, by precision fermentation. And then I did my second postdoc, which is the job I'm doing right now with Professor Eugenie Rora. Um, we, are call, we call ourselves the um, Nutrition and Chemosensing Science Group. So as Sharam has mentioned, I'm doing a lot of um, general omics work, including transcriptomic, gen uh, genomics, um, um, proteomics, and metabolomics. With a um, lot of the tissues from pig and chicken, and I'm also the lab manager for Hartley Tickle C212. And personally, my current project is more about the taste receptor characterization and animal tissue metabolism study with some work um, relating glycogen, which is a continuous work from my PhD. So this is the work I'm talking about today. So let me introduce to you um, from the glycogen synthesis. So it all starts with this small protein called glycogenin. It presents as a dimer in nature. The reason why it is called glycogenin, literally, literally this means glycogen initiator. So this is the initiator for glycogen synthesis. The reason is this protein can self-glucosylate um, using glucose as a substrate to form a very short-chain oligosaccharide. And this short-chain oligosaccharide is the primer for glycogen synthesis. So when glycogen synthase, synthase comes along, it will further elongate this short chain um, oligosaccharide to a long chain um, um, sugar chains. And when the glycogen branching enzyme comes, it will catalyze um, the branching pattern of the um, sugar chains. So when this process is going and going, then we have the glycogen beta particles, which is a compact um, polysaccharide existing very widely in um, all different tissues in mammals. So hierarchically, there are three different levels of glycogen from the level one, referring to the linear branching pattern to level two, which basically refers to the um, beta particles and level three, um, referring to the, the um, alpha particles, which is basically composed of um, small beta particles by some mechanism. So generally, um, glycogen is an important biofunctional compound in life activities that has been identified in all domains of life. Glycogen structure is divided into three hierarchies as I have just introduced to you. Glycogen was believed to be essential for glycogen synthesis. And glycogen was also proposed to link glycogen beta particles into alpha particles. And uh, an earlier research by Professor um, Bob Kilbert says um, any organism using glucose for energy must evolve a system which behaves like a glycogen for glucose control. However, there are some um, recent studies shows contradictory result from our perception um, traditionally that glycogen may be not essential for glycogen synthesis. And most of the work is on um, the muscle in mice. Here, I'm giving you two published um, papers on that. So from the publications, we have identified some gap knowledge. Like the first one is how does glycogen absence affect liver metabolism, which is one of the main glucose storage organ in mammals? And how does glycogen absence affect the liver glycogen structure, which is, um, a very um, widely existing polysaccharide, especially to its higher level, level two and the level three, which is basically referring to the um, RFI and the beta particles. So here we come, based on these questions, we have come up with this experimental design. We have knocked out glycogen from the mice, which is done by our, our collaborator in Spain. And we use this as an experimental group and compared with the wild type mice, we, collect the um, we collected the tissues, um, the liver tissues, and done some SWOT proteomics analysis as a pilot study. And 
also as a tool, as a exploratory data analysis tool um, to generate hypotheses about glycogeny effect on liver and liver glycogen. Then we designed um, some more experiment to test the hypotheses we have generated. So um, here's the method of the SWOT analysis of the whole liver proteome. Um, so we have collected um, a few wild type and glycogeny knockout mice liver, which was snap frozen and transported, donated by our Spanish collaborator. So the whole liver proteome were extracted and subject to FASP um, preparation for SWOT analysis in SMB. And we have identified in total 750 proteins um, with the very low FDR in the DDA mode. And then we um, used SWOT to quantify those proteins and subject those um, protein abundances to principal component analysis and MS stats for statistical comparison. So um, the result shows, I mean, the result from principal component analysis as shown on the left panel here, shows that the wild type, which is the black dot, is relatively um, clustering together, while the glycogeny knockout mice um, are relatively scattering in the coordinates from the PC1 and PC2. So in the um, statistical comparison by MS stats, um, we have generated this for planar plot showing the, um, the statistical result. The red represents the differentially um, abundant proteins we have characterized in this biological comparison. So there are quite a lot of proteins we can look at. So based on these differentially abundant proteins, um, we used GOTEM enrichment analysis to um, generate, um, to, to look at what GOTEMs are enriched from these differentially abundant proteins using the whole proteome as a background. So the result is here. On the left panel is the increased proteins, um, is the GOTEMs from the increased proteins um, in the glycogen knockout versus wild type comparison. And on the right is the decreased proteins. So if we look at the um, biological conditions, I mean, the biological process, there are quite a few um, go terms um, have highlighting um, by itself, like lipid metabolism process, um, oxidation reduction process, and um, metabolic process. When we look at the decreased um, go term, uh, I mean, the go terms from the decreased protein least, um, there is more um, um, go terms we're looking at, but when we look at the proteins more specifically, it all leads to very similar protein list involving in lipid metabolism, oxidation reduction process, and, metabolo and metabolomic process pathways from both of the protein list. More specifically, there are four categories we have um, we, are, we are looking at on the those um, differential abundant protein list. The first one is the mitochondria proteins relating to TCA cycle. So this is the um, energy production process um, happening in my mitochondria, which is also very active in liver. The second second category we are looking at is uh, we have, actually have identified some glycogen metabolism related proteins. For example, glycogen phosphorylase, which is relating to the um, glycogen breakdown process. Also, cyto cytochrome um, protein families, uh, which is only a few, but they still exist. And then the fourth category is the fatty acid acetylcoenzyme metabolism, which basically means um, we might be we might have some um, um, carbohydrate fatty acid um, interconversion change happening in this process. So based on the observation we have identified a few um, hypotheses we want to test. The first one is um, glycogeny knockout mass liver might be defect in carbohydrate synthesis and degradation metabolism. The second one is the glycogeny knockout mice might be defect in carbohydrate fatty acid interaction or interconversion. The third one is since we have observed, observed a lot of um, glycogen metabolism related proteins, we are postulating glycogen knockout mice liver glycogen structure might be altered under these abnormal biological um, conditions. 
So based on these a few hypotheses, we have generated and um, we are um, designing new experiment to test our hypothesis. So in the first hypothesis about the glycogen um, carbohydrate synthesis and degradation um, metabolism, we have first to look at the um, glucose level, I mean, fasting glucose level, glucose tolerance test, glucose um, insulin tolerance test, and a glucose in, um, tolerance test to the live animal. So what we did is um, we have the um, normal mice fed and happy, and then we are fasting the mice for up to 36 hours. And then we monitor the glucose level change at the end of the fasting stage, we are injecting some molecules like glucose, glucagon, insulin to the mice and then monitor the glucose um, um, pattern, increasing or decreasing pattern again to see how does the animal responds to this um, stimulus. So the result shows um, like the glucose um, tolerance test, glucagon tolerance test, and the insulin tolerance test has a very similar profile overall between the um, two biological comparisons. The glucose um, glucose level um, response when it is the fasting stage shows at the first 12 hours, um, the mammals, I mean the mice can maintain the blood glucose level at a relatively um, stable level. And starting from the 24th hour, um, the gl blood glucose level is dropping down to a new state, but still relatively stable. And there are some minor differences we have observed from um, this um, tolerance test. Like after fasting for 24 hours, glycogenin knockout mice liver actually shows a slightly higher level of glucose than the wild type. And wild type mice liver has a slightly higher peak glucose level at this point, which is 30 minutes after glucose injection, then the um, glycogeny knockout mice. So the te second test we are doing um, is regarding to the glycogen degradation and resynthesis in both of the um, um, you know, in both the group of mice. So what we have done is we have live animal glycogeny knockout animal and um, wild type mice. So we sacrificed um, some of them to measure the um, baseline glucose content, sorry, um, glycogen content. And then we fast the rest of the mice for up to um, 24 hours. And then we inject glucose and sacrificed um, the mice in different batches after 30 minutes and 60 minutes. And then we measure the glycogen content and glycogen synthesis activity in the liver. So under this hypothesis, um, we would expect from our experiment design, a few things could be happening, like the glycogen content would be the most obvious one. We would expect glycogen knockout mice would have a lower glycogen content than the wild type, simply because glycogen normally would depleted when the glycogen is knocked out for or malfunctioning. The second result we're expecting is the glycogen resynthesis process should be slower since glycogen synthesis happens on oligosaccharides, which is provided by the glycogen. So without this primer, we would expect the glucose recruitment kin kinetics will be slowing down. And also the glycogen synthase activity. Since glycogen synthase is the key enzyme for the glycogen synthesis, it should align with glycogen content change in the liver. So these are the um, three um, results we are expecting it to happen. So here it is um, what is actually happened. So this um, x-axis shows the different stage of the um, fed fasting glucose injection um, for 30 minutes and um, 60 minutes. So the y-axis shows the glycogen content um, normalized, normalized by um, the weight of the tissue. So glycogen content actually shows a huge decrease, de de decrease when the fed mice are fasted, like drops down to this very, very low level um, when it's fasted for um, 24 hours. And at this point, when, our, when we have um, injected the glucose to the mice, 
Surprisingly, after 30 minutes of time, glycogen in knockout mice can accumulate um, glycogen uh, slightly but um, significantly quicker than the wild type. And, and the wild type is catching up at 60 minutes um, time point. So the catching up um, may be explained by the glycogen synthase activity we have measured. So this is the time point, um, the same time point as in here, like um, glycogen, sorry, glycogen synthase activity in the wild type mice have higher level than the um, glycogen knockout mice. So this is possibly saying the glycogen synthesis without primer or with an alternative primer, no matter what the mechanism is, um, the glycogen synthesis in the glycogen knockout mice is faster than the glycogen oligosaccharide as a primer. So this is a surprise to us. The third test we have done under this hypothesis is um, we have monitored some key enzyme activity and quantity. So from the previous test, um, we find the fasted and um, 30 minutes injection of glucose is a key time point as we have shown here. If you have forgot about that, like this is the time point we find the most um, different between the two biological um, um, conditions. So this time point is a key time point where glycogen in knockout mice shows difference with the wild type mice. And glycogen in knockout actually, uh, glycogen knockout mice actually accumulates glycogen faster than the wild type and has lower blood glucose level. We therefore further postulate based on our first observation that glycogen synthesis and glycogen degradation related enzyme activity might be different in the two group of mice. Basically, we're trying to find why does we why do we um, observe this surprising difference um, in these two um, comparisons. So uh, we have first identified glycogen liver glycogen synthase, um, liver glycogen phosphorylase, and um, glyceride. Um, um, glyceride three phosphate uh, dehydrogenase um, enzyme, which is also part of the glycogen breakdown pathway. We monitored their relative um, quantity by Western blood, and we also did some in vitro um, assay to monitor the glycogen synthase and glycogen phosphorylase activity. But surprisingly, we didn't find any um, biological um, meaningful difference between these two groups. Basically, that says um, no matter from the content point of view or the quantity point of view or from the activity point of view, the both of the two um, group of mice are very similar. So um, if not enzyme activity, how about some key intermediate concentration? Um, for example, some ATP, um, AMP, ATP, and ATP, which is involved in energy production. And how about some electric supply chains um, in ready to metabolize like NAD and NADP? Because they are so prevalent and they are so um, like they're easier to detect. So we have done some um, in vitro um, biochemical assay, but still says the relative concentration of every metabolite we are monitoring doesn't show a significant, like statistically significant um, difference in the two comparisons. So now we are very confused, like what is happening? Why does this model um, give us a surprising result as we have just mentioned? And based on the second um, hypothesis um, about the carbohydrate fatty acid interaction, um, which is basically because we have monitored a lot of fatty acid um, in related proteins um, from our proteomics result. So we hypothesized that um, kit, um, some key liver, met meta liver metabolites related to carbohydrate fatty acid metabolism should convey very different quantity in the two group of mice. So we have detected um, lactate, glucose 6 phosphate, um, triglyceride, and so also some liver ATP. Which is which um basically um involving in glucose breakdown process or fatty acid synthesis process. 
So the result shows uh, lactate and um, glucose 6-phosphate, which is involving in the glucose breakdown process. Um, they are kind of uh, relating, like consistent with our previous finding, like the fed mice has the high level of the um, metabolites. And when they are in the fasting stage, they're dropping down to a relatively small, but um, low level. And the triglyceride, we have a monitor in the liver is not a surprise at all. Um, when it's fed, um, the liver doesn't produce a lot of um, tri um, glass, right? And when they are fasted and the fatty acid is becoming the alternative energy source for the mice, and then we have observed an increase um, in the process, then they are um, essentially relatively stable in the glucose injection stage. And the ATP production is kind of um, consistent with our previous um, observation here. Like at 30 minutes of time point, we observed a ATP increase, even though it's um, like small change, but still um, significant um, statistically at this same time point, fasted plus 30 minutes glucose injection. So this is consistent with our previous um, observation. So the take home message from this two hypothesis testing is um, glycogenin knockout mice and mice, wild type mice liver shows overall very similar response to glucose um, stimulus, insulin stimulus, stimulus and glucagon um, stimulus. We didn't observe biological, um, sorry, biochemical differences from the key enzyme activity, intermediate metabolite uh, quantity or liver lactate and triglyceride concentration. The only difference we have we have monitored in the first two hypothesis testing is glycogen knockout mice can accumulate liver glycogen faster than the wild type mice at 30 minutes glucose injection when the mice is fasted for um, 24 hours. Then the wild type mice liver glycogen stock can gradually catch us up at um, 60 minutes of time. So there remains a question that we didn't, um, or we're not sure on how to explain that yet, yet is the um, the mechanism of glycogen synthesis without glycogen in is still unknown. So here we have proposed a few mechanisms we are going to test further. Um, the first one is if there's no glycogen in, and what is the primer for the glycogen synthesis? The obvious answer is an alternative primer. We're not sure what alternative primers um, we can think of specifically yet, but um, whenever there is a sugar chain or whenever there is um, some oligosaccharide, that could be an alternative substrate for the glycogen synthesis, uh, glycogen synthase to work. Or alternatively, even though glycogen synthase was proposed to directly, um, not directly work on glucose substrate because glycogen synthase requires a oligosaccharide to be active, but we have seen um, in some in vitro study that glycogen synthase can work on glucose substrate directly. Um, we're not sure whether this is happening in our model, but there's further experiment uh, we can think about. So this is still an open question um, we are not sure about the answer yet. So if you um, if you have any questions or any comments or any thoughts on that, um, it will be a good discussion after this. Then based on the um, third hypothesis we're posting from the early stage of the preliminary result, we checked out the um, glycogen structure. So what we do is based on this very special um, time point, that is that the mice was fasted and injected with glucose for 30 minutes. Then we take out the liver and we extract the glycogen from the um, two groups of mice liver and characterized with their glycogen structure. Okay, so for those of you who are not sure how we do the glycogen structure characterization, so we have used an instrument called size exclusion chromatography, which is basically an instrument that can separate the polysaccharide by the size. And then we can observe this weight distribution um, against the um, hydrodynamic um, radius, which is basically the size of the polysaccharide. So what we can see 
is glycogen alpha particles and glycogen beta particles. They can be separated very well. And by looking at the relative ratio of these two um, polysaccharides, we can get a snapshot or we can get some information about how does this alpha and glycogen beta particles were changing um, in the mice liver. So here's our result. When we have the fasted wild type mice and fasted plus 30 minutes glucose injection in both of the um, genotype, First of all, um, this SEC, um, this solid um, black solid light in the middle is the average of the weight distribution. The shadow area referring to the um, variance um, we, are like, we are looking at from the different biological replicates. So we are looking at most of the um, glycogen particles were distributed at the alpha particle area. You see like this is above 35 which is basically here, big um, particle area, big particle area, which means basically there's only alpha particle left, um, which is this one here in the wild type and glycogeny knockout um, mice liver. When they are fasting and rejected with um, 30 minutes, um, with glucose after 30 minutes, and the result still shows um, no difference in the two group of mice. Like this one is still meaning alpha particles. This is still meaning um, beta particles. So this is a surprise again. Like basically we didn't see any significant difference about the alpha and the beta particle relative to ratio or the relative weight distribution between these two groups, even though um, this time point is the most significant um, difference we can observe from the um, animal experiment. So we next, test um, a different hypothesis, I mean, a different test by glycogen acid hydrolysis study. So for this, for those of you who are not familiar with how this is working, I'm, I'm using some slides from a previous publication by Pru, um, Prudence Power in Robert Gilbert's group. So what this um, hydrolysis pattern says is wild type mice liver glycogen degradation pattern present a two-phase pattern when it is incubated at pH um, 3.5 for some period. So what, they mean, what this means is, let's suppose um, the um, liver glycogen is degrading uniformly, like alpha and the beta particles are de degrading together. So this is what we call a uniform degradation. So the blue line here, the blue um, distribution here represents the uniform um, degradation, which means with the time going on, with the time going on, both of the peaks were degrading gradually. Like you can see, this is like around um, 60 to 80 nanometer, whereas at the end of the um, incubation, it will be degrading, um, like this area should be um, disappearing but the alpha particle peak should be still here. This is what we call a uniform degradation. Like both the two areas are degrading uniformly. Whereas um, a two phase pattern says the alpha particle area, which is basically the red line here. If you take a close look at the red line here, it will be disappearing faster than the um, uniform distribution. See here? So here is the most obvious difference. So by the um, two-phase pattern, we should be able to monitor the acid hydrolysis um, pattern um, in the different, in two different kind of um, glycogen structures. So under this hypothesis that glycogenin is the linking, um, is, uh, is the linkage between the um, beta particles to form alpha particles, we would expect glycogen in knockout mice glycogen should not present a two-phase degradation pattern um, because it was proposed before glycogen is the linkage between the beta particles, but now it's gone. So there's no difference or there's no um, biochemical or linkage bond difference between alpha and the beta particles. So we would expect it should not uh, present a two-phase degradation pattern. So what we identified um, in the wild type mice is kind of um, 
consistent with our previous um, um, publication, like alpha particle area, which is basically here, 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 and here. It is degrading away gradually, like at the very first, before the incubation or without pH um, 3.5 incubation, there's abundant um, of alpha particles, but with the degrade degradation going on, um, a lot of alpha particles are disappearing first. So now, when we have looked at the what happens in the glycogen knockout mice, is actually surprising as well. Like the glycogen particle, sorry, glycogen alpha particle in this area is also degrading away gradually. Um, this shows a large variance mainly from one of our biological replicates, which has a lot of alpha particles in the beginning and doesn't show um, a lot of degradation pattern um, along the way uh, in the whole process, um, maybe due to technical process. But for most of the um, weight distribution, we can still see like alpha particle here, 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 and here are still degrading faster than the beta particle um, peak. Unfortunately, we only have enough sample to incubate up to 18 hours. So it would be better if we can continue this um, incubation, but the um, tissue is, I mean, the glycogen is gone. So what we have observed is alpha particles were first degraded into beta particles under acid incubation, showing a two-phase degradation pattern, which is not matching or not consistent with our hypothesis based on our um, previous publication. So the SEC weight distribution could not distinguish any differences between the glycogen from the two groups of, groups of mice. So basically this is saying um, what type and the glycogen knockout mice from the first two tests, we can say like, they're just, they're just the same. There's no difference with the alpha and the beta particles we are looking at. So then we alternative, alternatively, looked at their level one structure. If you recall my introduction, um, level one structure refers to the um, linear or branching pattern. Like we just uh, used a um, technique called um, fluorescence assisted carbohydrate and our capillary um, to check at their chain length distribution to see, okay, how many chains, uh, how many chains are in um, like one glucose um, DP how many are two, how many are three, how many are four. So this is called a chain length distribution. But unfortunately, we didn't observe any significant difference or any difference between these two group of mice as well. Like the at the end of the experiment, we're running out of the glycogen knockout mice. They are very hard to obtain, but still we have at least three replicates and um, of the glycogen knockout liver and at least um, four replica five replicates from the wild type mice liver. On this um, chain length distribution, we still didn't see any significant differences between the two biological groups. So basically this shows that the beta particle branching pattern within these two group of mice um, liver glycogen are not different um, at all. So the key point we can take away from this um, general hypothesis testing is um, glycogen knockout mice liver proteome characterization shows significantly different abundant proteins relating to carbohydrate metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, and their interaction or interconversion between each other, and cytochrome proteins, and also some um, energy production proteins, which also relating to the carbohydrate metabolism. Our animal experiment and biochemical characterization has only showed minor differences in glycogen resynthesis rate at mice that were fasted and injected with the glucose for 30 minutes. So 30 minutes is actually a short time, but um, if we're lucky enough to detect that. And um, glucose, glucagon, and insulin tolerance tests showed a very similar pattern between the glycogen in knockout and what type of comparison. And SEC or phase characterization shows glycogen knockout and what type of mice liver glycogen structure were the same. So this is a totally surprising result for us. Like we're expecting a huge difference when the glycogen is knocked out from the mice since uh, it, is, it was proposed essential. It was proposed um, to be very important for glycogen synthesis, 
but our result seems does not support our previous or the canonical um, observation. It, it is more consistent with more modern or most recent observations. So does this mean um, glycogenin is redundant? Like is the evolution theory wrong? Like evolutionary theory issues like we are undergoing like nature screening. Um, we like the animal uh, and, and animals should not develop a protein, especially when um, we are under a high pressure of the evolution. Does this mean glycogenin is redundant? And why does glycogen exist in the mammals first? So let me step back and have to point out that canonically in some other publications as well, naturally, whenever there's no glycogen, then there's no glycogen. So what we have observed here, the glycogen not out mice, they are actually selected or have survived from the lab experiment, which means basically we might be looking at the survival bias. In the other aspect, on, from the other point of view, this survival bias, which is these um, glycogen knockout mice, provide us an opportunity to study glycogen biochemical function in vivo, which means even though in nature, um, glycogen is essential, but the chance that we have these glycogen free mice and we can look at their metabolism by some mo uh, modern omics and biochemical studies, it is a great opportunity for us. Um, to check the glycogen function in vivo. And we uh, have to point out like glycogen, it may convey other unknown functions regarding to glycogen synthesis rate, especially when we don't have a um, plausible or verified mechanism to explain how does mice glycogen compensate, sorry, how does mice compensate for the absence of glycogen and develop a system that still have the um, the wild type like um, glycogen. So in conclusion, um, our glycogen is dispensable in liver mice glycogen synthesis and glycogen knockout on only in alternate mouse liver metabolism to a minor extent, including faster glycogen accumulation rate at an early stage of the glycogen synthesis. And glycogen knockout does not affect the mouse tolerance um, to glucose, insulin, and glucagon um, injection. And glycogen maintains its structure when glycogen is absent, which is a totally surprise for us. Um, mechanisms of mice liver compensating for glycogen function remains um, further exploration. So we are trying to submit this um, manuscript to some journal. So any um, questions if you have is very, um, is extremely welcome. So thank you. I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Eugenie Rora, and um, every other author who has contributed to um, this um, research, including um, Mitch Sullivan, Rob Spade, and our Spanish collaborators, um, Fran, John, and Jolly, and my professor, um, PhD supervisor, Ben Schurz. And I would, would I, I would also like to give a special thanks to my partner Xiao Xi Li, who has been um, so supporting for my academic research. Okay, question time. All right. Well, uh, fantastic. That was um, a whole a bunch of really exciting and interesting um, uh, result and experiment that you show, Shang Li. Um, thank you. Thank you. While we're just waiting for the questions to come through, um, you know, I, I myself have a lot of questions to be honest, but but obviously we will give priority to the one that will come through the Q and A. So I will remind everybody else again, please send your questions through Q and A um, button. So uh, meanwhile, I'm gonna ask just um, about the knockout mice. So the glycogen in knock, knockout mice. I was wondering between the knockout and the wild. Did you see any uh, clinical differences or subclinical differences? Um, um, yes, yes. The how did you confirm? Like, the, the, was there any confirmation that the knockdown has actually been successful? Yes, um, yes. The um, successful development of the model is um, verified in the previous publication. So this is done by our Spanish um, collaborators. 
um, already. So in the previous publication, um, basically is in this paper. Um, so this paper um, is published in Selma Tap Prison. Um, this has um, verified the successfulness of the um, animal model. So what they have observed in this paper is lack of glycogenic causes, glycogen accumulation and the muscle function impairment. Like um, they have also observed glycogen structure, but their characterization technique says the glycogen in the knockout mice is actually bigger than the wild type mice. And the glycogen knockout mice have decreased oxidation rate, uh, have decreased endurance and oxygen um, consumption and CO2 output when the mice is subjected to like um, um, third meal challenge. So we do observe some physiological differences between these two groups. And they also did some technical um, characterization, characterization uh, including um, genomics, PCR confirmation, and proteomics, and they didn't identify the glycogenic from the knockout mice. So um, their function, their result is mainly on the muscle. So they do um, observe some difference in the muscle, but they didn't observe a lot of difference in the liver, which is consistent with my um, collection structure and um, proteome um, characterization. Like we do identify minor um, difference, but that difference is basically nothing. That doesn't change the metabolism um, significantly or substantially. All right, but in terms of like body weight and everything else, they were the same, yeah? So um, I'm not sure about that. That they may, uh, our Spanish um, collaborator might have the details uh, I can check, but that's a good point to check. I don't know about that. Yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. One question. We've got one question here. I'm just reading out the question. So how relevant is the mouse model for human for glycogen production? Oh, that's a good one. So um so we know like a mouse has a relatively smaller genome than the human and as well as the proteome. So there is a lot of relevance between the human and mouse proteome. So in terms of the glycogen, mouse only have one type of glycogen, like glycogen one, and human have glycogen two. Um, so basically human have a um, tissue specific um, glycogen distribution, like in liver, human have glycogen two, in, in the muscle, um, human have glycogen one, but they are very similar. Like most, they are, um, their catalytic domain is the same. Um, their um, how do I say the um, in the amorphous area, the length is different, but the biological function, I mean, the biochemical function of that area is unknown. So, um, I, was, I would say like in the mouse model is the great opportunity for us to study the um absence of glycogen in general, um, in vivo. Like it is very hard to um study how does um, when the human is knocked out of glycogen, first of all, we're not allowed to do that. Even in some rare case where human has developed some um, glycogen storage disease due to um, glycogen malfunction, which is close to the glycogen knockout, even in that model, um, it is very hard for us to get a model of the both of the glycogen being knocked, uh, knocked out. So in general, uh, when we want to um, look at the how does human behave when glycogen is knocked out completely both of the types, I guess mouse model is a direct um direct um compared um uh, direct model um substitute for humans. But if we want to look at the um differences between glycogen one and glycogen two in human, um, that is not relevant um to our study simply because mouse doesn't have a second subtypes of glycogen. All right, more question. So um, I've got another question here, which is um, you, you mentioned the pH of 3.5, where yes. you were talking about the pattern of hydrolysis in the liver, I guess, related to glycogen. So um, how physiologically relevant is that pH? I mean, is is that what um, we have in the liver, a pH? Is that normal, that pH, or? That's a great question. No, the um, 
let me bring that slide. So this um, pH 3.5 doesn't naturally happen in the liver, especially when the liver glycogen is breaking down. It normally happens at um, slightly acid um, condition, but not ex as extreme as 3.5, not like that. The reason we are looking at 3.5 is simply because this um, is proved to be a great condition to reveal um, the difference between different glycogen structure previously, and it has to be in vitro. It doesn't happen um, in vivo, but it is a great in vivo, condi in vitro condition for us to observe the glycogen structure, um, especially from um, very different glycogen structures. Right, it's just a model, basically. Yes. All right. Fantastic. All right. If we don't have more question, well, I still have more question, but okay. Yeah, we've got one here. Uh, on, on protein level, what's the knockout cause from the wild? Uh, so, okay, so, because it came in two parts, the question. Let me read it again if it's unclear. So, on protein level, what's the knockout cause from the wild, wild type? Oh, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, uh, me, knockout me cause. Either. Oh, okay, so probably the, uh, so another piece of information came through except the glycogen. So what what it, I think on the protein level, what what the question, if I'm understanding correctly, is that when you knock out the uh, mice, all right, that knockout yeah. at the protein level, except for the glycogening, what sort of other causes might have? You know, what sort of other impact might have if I'm um, are you looking uh, asking like what um proteome differences we have observed from the glycogen in knockout mice compared with the wild type? I uh, sort of a, yeah, I kind of probably yeah, that's what the question is about. Yeah, sorry, um, if the person I can assume. send the question again, that would be great. But yeah. um so it says on protein level, what's the knockout cause from the wild type except the Glycogenin. Right. Are you asking like except for glycogenin is absent? Oh, yeah. What oh, other so proteins? Is there have... any other effect in addition to glycogenin? You know, when you knock out the mice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That's a good one. So, um, in this slide, I'm not. I didn't go into too much detail, but um, this slide here might have explained no. So this slide here might have explained some of them. So that um, we have basically over 100 proteins being, being differentially um, abundant, and it's very hard to list every one of them. So I just summarized them into these four categories that we have observed. There are some other proteins basically relating to glycogen metabolism, that like glycogen phosphorylase, and other mitochondria proteins relating to um, the energy production and cytochrome proteins and fatty acid metabolism, which is um, basically why we have come up with these three hypotheses we want to test. Like when we design the experiment, um, this hypothesis may not be easily to think of. So basically these um, um, differentially abundant proteins is a good exploratory data analysis tool for us to generate a, a more appropriate hypothesis. So our hypothesis is based on the proteins that, that has been um, characterized except for glycogen. So, so if you want you, to know yeah. more specifically, you can contact me um, privately. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this with you. All right. Uh, yep. Yeah. So another question is, I mean, the follow-up question is, uh, co Cause in starch synthesis, some protein except enzyme and uh, substrate could affect the synthesis process. There might be some protein in this procedure. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. There must be some compensation when glycogen is knocked out. We're just not sure what um, that um, um, compensating proteins are yet. So basically from the um, proteins that has been characterized as differentially abundant. Um, we did we cannot think of a lot of um, um, like specific mechanisms um, can be regarded as an alternative mechanism. But mm. we basically have checked other metabolites and enzyme activity um, to explain 
why we have observed this um, weird result, including glycogen synthase activity, glycogen phosphorylase activity, and some other ADP, AMP, AD, um, ATP um, concentration. So we do um, agree that some other proteins definitely might have compensated for this process. We're just not sure what they are yet. Hmm. All right. Yep. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. So there's no more question, I guess. So, yeah, pretty much. Just want to make sure that I'm not leaving anything behind. Yeah, I think it's all good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Inlay, and thanks everybody. If you can just flick, uh, flick over to the next to the slides for me. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, we're getting uh, close to uh, 1 p.m., but um, before that, um, I would like to introduce the next speaker and the next uh, coffee science seminar that we have. The next uh, 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 speaker will be uh, Dr. Glenn Fox. I mean, probably uh, it's a familiar face. He used to work in, the, uh, in coffee, and he will be presenting omics analysis in the world oldest beverage probably you guys know what that means so i encourage you to um to come and um you know uh, follow that uh presentation it will be quite interesting so he's uh right now uh at the university of uh, california davis he will be visiting coffee and he will be giving this seminar here so um with the, if you have any other question for shenley you can also send it through and uh, you will be happy to take it through email and anything else. So, and also at the end, um, if you're um, interested in the seminar, um, please uh, feel free to check out this website, check out the Coffee Science Seminar website, and you can subscribe and you can regularly receive our emails. And, and also there's a YouTube channel that you can go and have a look at all these seminars. So thank you very much, all of you, and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Sharon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.